What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Submission Fishing Podcast. We're on episode five. For those of you guys that don't know, that are new to this, um, this is the traditional episode five, but I've got about, I think, 100 plus episodes on YouTube where I was doing a live show prior to this. So if you like this content, you can find it on YouTube. I had about 100 of these, probably 100 plus, uh, but now we're doing the long form thing and uh, just not doing it live anymore, doing recordings ever since I moved. Just switching the time change. My name is Mike Muto. I'm the owner of Submission Fishing Company. I make slow pitch jigs. This show is not about slow pitch jigs. It's about everything. Uh, it's our goal just to get you guys a black belt in fishing. And I got a great guest with us today. And his name is Jeff from Battlefish. Is that correct? Yep. What's your last name? Stahoviak. Stahoviak. I know yeah. I asked you before, but I, I wasn't going to try it. <laughs> That's right. So Jeff, I, Jeff at Battlefish is good. Jeff at Battlefish. So I met Jeff basically since I moved here from California to Florida, I'm on the St. John's River, and I've basically been binge-watching a lot of his content. So, Jeff, I know you've fished these waters for so long, and it's, I found you, and then um, actually my fishing rep who I work with, he found you first. He was out here staying in my house, sleeping on like a little bed or whatever, <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you got to check out this guy's channel. He's got a great... I think you got him on some tarpon, because he went out and he caught some oh, yeah, a good, couple good. months ago, good. and um, you know, he turned me on to your channel, and he's just... I've been binge watching it, and yeah. then I just sent you a random email. It was like, yeah. "Hey, you want to be on the podcast?" And you invited me out to like a Salt Strong event, and yep. it was really good. It yeah, was really good. It's great. So, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself for the yeah. audience. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm retired, so uh, I uh, this I tell the people the secret to uh, being a successful fisherman is to fish every day. <laughs> but uh, the problem, you know, obviously is is uh, you know a lot. Most people are only fishing weekends, maybe two, three times a month, and it's tough to. It's first of all the, f the fish change constantly. So, I'm uh, retired from uh, Sunbelt Rentals. I was thirty, almost thirty four years there um, as a safety training director. Uh, did training for uh, customers mostly and. Uh, uh, everything safety uh, for uh, construction equipment. Oh, nice. Yeah, so scaffolding, aerial lifts, forklifts. And I have a little uh, uh, LLC company, consulting company as well, that I do some uh, side jobs with and uh, expert witness work. Nice. So nice. subject matter expert, they call it. So um, Man of many hats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, master of none. <laughs> the uh, So, yeah, I retired... What, two years ago? I forget who now. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, uh, but even before that, I got, a, I got a boat. I had a kayak, a pedal kayak I bought from a guy, um, a native, a 10-foot pedal ki kayak, okay. which was great, yeah. great little, and it's lightweight, so I could put it on top of the car and a pickup truck that I had. And, um, but uh, I always wanted a boat. I had, I've had, this is my third boat. I had a 15-foot whaler, then I had a 17-foot whaler that I renovated the entire boat. It was a 79 boat, um, put a 70-horse uh, Evinrude four-stroke, which they call an Evanzuki because it's a, actually a Suzuki motor. With, oh, interesting. I didn't with, know that, actually. Yeah, That's, that's when the uh, There was a 2001, so when the emissions changed on outboard motors, uh, Evinrude partnered with Suzuki, uh, no, Evinrude and Johnson partnered with Suzuki. So if you if you see a four stroke that has a Johnson label on it or an Evinrude label, it's actually a Suzuki engine. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I had no idea about I, that. I picked one up on uh, eBay in a crate brand new uh, for about $5,000, which was a super steel, and put it on the uh, whaler, redid the dashboard, redid a bunch of stuff on the boat, and then sold it for half the money I had in it. Yeah, <laughs> like typical boat. That's how it goes with boats, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You never get out what you put in. No, because I had a brand new trailer on it, you know, bought a new trailer, and it's, yeah, right. it's crazy. But it was a great boat, my uh, my daughter. But I, uh, my daughters loved it. But the reason I sold it, and this is just a funny story too, is uh, my oldest daughter, she was involved in science projects, so a lot of weekends were doing that. And then my younger daughter eventually was on three different soccer teams and I had to sell a boat. I mean, it just wasn't using it because right. every weekend we were going on a Friday night, driving to Savannah, driving to Orlando, even had some tournaments in Atlanta. Uh, it was crazy. And um, when I was at Sunbelt, I used to talk to these young guys uh, that would come to my classes and they're hunting and fishing and everything and they got new kids and I'm going, 
you're going to be giving all that up. Oh, no, I'm not. I go, yeah, you will. <laughs> it's going to take up a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and you go where your kids want to go, you know. And um, soccer was a, was a huge, huge deal. They won, uh, they won a 3v3 national tournament at Disney at nine years, nine years old. Yeah. And then my daughter's high school team won the state championship uh, before the year she graduated in 2022. And uh, so anyway, so that takes up a lot of time. So I sold that boat and eventually uh, retired and I went through an amicable divorce and uh, was able to buy this boat off a guy who actually literally cried when I drove away. He, he was... Uh, he was attached to it. Huh? Yeah, he, yeah. It's, it's, a great, it's a great boat and uh, he did a lot of... Uh, you know, by himself fishing, and uh, he had grandkids, and his wife was bugging him to get a bigger boat so he could take the kids fishing and stuff, and yeah, and um, it was pretty bare bones at the time. It had a, a manual Mancota trolling motor on it. Um, it had a it had a power pole. It had a seventy horse Yamaha. Had about three hundred hours on it. I've got almost. I got. I'm right at a thousand hours now. That's how much I've used it. Wow. In three years, it'll be three years December. Had it. Yeah, three years December. Well, and you... uh, it's made by a company called Dino out of Tampa, Florida, that was in business for a short period of time. And uh, I think this, <clears throat> by the serial number, I think it's the ninth boat he built. I think they only built like 12 of them oh, that wow. I can figure out. That's awesome. Yeah, I did discover through some emails, I mean, uh, Google searches, that it was in the Tampa boat show. My boat was in the Tampa boat show. Um, and um, it's sort of a copy of the Hughes Lapside, the old Hughes 17-foot Red Fisher Lapside. Um, but it doesn't have the fit and finish of a Hughes or, a, or an action craft or anything like that. It's, um, but it floats. It does great. Um, it's, and I love buying used boats because I don't have to worry about dinging them up. Um, right. It's right. Already, yeah, it's already running into a dock or something or... Or having somebody run into you, or you know, some goofy thing, or getting it sideways on the trailer, or whatever. Yeah, so, that's true. It's a good perspective. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I do all my own repairs, um, all my own service. Um, you know, reasonably mechanically inclined, but you know, YouTube's a great help there too. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and the big problem with taking your boat someplace to have it serviced is not the cost, although that is an issue it's the two or three months it takes them to do something because all these boat places are so backed right, up. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. And um, I did have an issue with my trim and tilt. I hired a guy, a mobile guy, come out and, and get the uh, gland nut off. I could not get it off. It was a really big wrench he needed, and I couldn't. I had a wrench big enough, but I could just could not get it off. He heated it up and got it off for me. But other than that, I had you know, pretty much do all myself. I rebuilt my trim and tilt, and it's been working great since it was leaking. So uh, again, again, thanks to YouTube, I was able to figure that out. Able to get it done. So were, yeah. you, were you fishing um, your whole life prior to retirement? Yeah, you... yeah. So I actually have a picture. I, I did a self strong presentation. I have a picture of me at about two years old with my hand on a seven and a half foot uh, Fleet Twin Evinrude motor my dad had at my grandfather's place. My grandfather, when he retired on my dad's side, he retired. He uh, bought a cottage, we called, it, we called it the cottage on the lake on the Rock River in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, Blackhawk Island. And he rented aluminum boats and sold bait and cleaned fish and sold fuel and all that. So, you know, since I was born, we were going out there. And then uh, when I was probably six, seven, eight years old, um, probably seven or eight years old, I think, uh, ended up staying, I would stay out there two, three weeks at a time in the summertime and help my grandfather. My parents would, you know, go back home and right. leave me out there. I had a younger brother and he, and he came out a few times too. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I helped, uh, unload guys' cars, load up the boat. We had these, <laughs> it's just a funny story. Yeah. These guys would come up from Decatur, Illinois, these, uh, preachers. One was a preacher. We called them the preacher. Uh, black guys would come up from uh, from California, uh, from uh, Decatur, Illinois, uh, to come fishing, and they're fishing catfish. So they'd come up during like a Friday afternoon, and I'd help. This is 1960, 
So it would have been 1962, 63. um, Back in the day. (laughs) Yeah, so I'd help them unload their their Cadillacs. They drove these big-ass Cadillacs. I'd help them unload their tackle boxes, metal tackle boxes, metal coolers into a 14-foot aluminum craft boat, and they put a motor on it, and they'd go out and fish all night and come back with, and I'm not kidding you, there was like four of these guys. They'd rent two boats, two of each boat, and they'd come back with coolers full of catfish. I mean, just coolers. Did they go out with guides, or they just no, got no, on no, themselves? No, no. They, they just went fish, out yeah. themselves, yeah. Yeah, we're, the Rock River pumped, uh, dumped into the Lake Kashkanang, and it was a big, very shallow lake with a lot of walleye, northern catfish, uh, crappie, bluegills, bass, you, know, you name it. It was in the river and lake. And, um, and that's awesome. Then my grandfather and I would spend the next day while they were sleeping, either in their car or my dad, my grandfather had a little room that he rented out. And uh, we'd clean the catfish all day. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> For them and package them up and put them in the freezer. That's awesome. And when did you start fishing the St. John's River? Um, really not. It's only been pretty much since I got the boat, so maybe three years. Okay, so uh, not It's not that been long. long. So but when I had my other boat, I fished St. Augustine a lot. Oh, okay. Um, and had, you know, mediocre luck there. Um, fishing shrimp. Typical shrimp or mullet, a lot of live bait we use and stuff like that. But I decided that I really wanted to challenge myself with artificial, and um, and uh, since I got the boat and and shrimp, the problem with shrimp, and and you've seen this in my videos, why I hate using shrimp, is there's a there's a, a catfish here called the hardhead catfish, and uh, if you're throwing shrimp, you're going to catch hardhead catfish constantly. Um, in my opinion, the most dangerous fish in the ocean. Why is that? They have three fins that stick out, one at the top and two on the side, and they are extremely sharp, pointed, and serrated, so that if they stick in your hand, you mm. can't get them out. They're poisonous at all? Or and no, it's just, semi-poisonous. Yeah, yeah I went to the hospital with one. Irritates uh, well, it was a sail cat that went through. I was fishing when I lived in... Um, when I moved to Florida, I moved to Fort Myers, Florida in 83. So I fished a lot Sanibel Island. Uh, Boca Grande, all that area, um, Calusatchee River, snook, black drum, redfish, some tarpon, sharks, a lot of sharks. Um, but I was wade fishing right at the Sanibel Causeway, which is a real popular place to wade fish, and I caught a sail cat, which is another type of catfish. Very good eating sail cat, very slimy. You'll know if you, if you ever get a sail cat bite, your, your line will have this thick slime on it. Um, <laughs> And um, I caught one, you know, I'm in waist deep water and it's, you know, you got the rod, you're trying to manage the fish and he flopped and stuck his side fin right through this webbing of my oh, hand. Now, good thing it went all the way through. So I was able to break it off with my pliers, get the fish off, and I was able to bite on the, on the piece that was coming through and, and, and pull it pull out. It out. Yeah. yeah, but my hand swelled up. Ended up going to the hospital, getting some shots, or I don't remember, oh, that was a long time ago. But that's, uh, yeah, the sail, the sail cats and the, uh, and the hardhead catfish are, are uh, a problem with shrimp. So, um, and you catch all kinds of trash fish. If, if you want to catch a lot of fish, shrimp is the way to go. There's no question yeah. about it. Yeah. But that's not my thing anymore. I don't want to catch, not that I don't want to catch a lot of fish, it's just that I want to catch fish that are worthy of a video. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and in uh, a different way too, you know, it's, yeah, I, I don't use any bait, but also, you know, I come from California and it's like, I've told this before, like bait's not really accessible. Um, yeah. You can't, can't throw nets. Okay. Um, nets are not allowed. So that really kind of eliminates, if you want to catch, you can do sabiki rig. If you want to catch bait, you got to use the sabiki. Yeah. But nobody's out there with the sabiki, but even that it's like, the only thing that's going to eat the sabiki are typically mackerel. Pretty, oh, okay. pretty decent sized mackerel. Oh, wow. Uh, the small, and they'll break you off. They'll break the sabiki off. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you get the small ones, you'd be okay. But yeah. Um, yeah, like you can't, you're not going to get little pinfish. You're not going to get bait fish. They don't, usually don't eat the sabiki. So yeah. getting bait is, isn't is really a, you have to go to like a bait. What we have is called bait receivers or bait barge is what we call them. You right. go up to a barge where they get it professionally delivered. Right. And then they put a scoop in your boat or yeah. just two scoops. Or they can even, even give you a kayak scoop. But, you know, if you're kind of a recreational guy, so it's, it's a lot of work to to get oh, yeah. bait out there. So yeah, a lot yeah. of Californians 
you have to learn to fish artificials fish because right. you, you can't go out and get bait and it's not going to be a quick thing. Yeah. Like, so most everybody just kind of resorts to fishing artificials. Right. So. Well, I that's the challenge. The challenge that. here too is, is if you're going to use live bait is, is getting live bait. So one of my favorite places to go uh, and get bait is a Goodby's Creek. There's a really good ramp there at Goodby's off of San Jose and Mandarin. And um, Goodby's Creek between the boat ramp and the river is usually, especially early in the morning, you throw a cast net five or six times, you know, you get, you'll get a live well full of a variety of fish, anything from tilapia to, to mullet to um, menhaden, um, pogies they call them here. Um, you know, you'll, you, can get, you can get a cooler full there. And it depends on time of year too. I, one of the things I wish I would do or uh, I probably won't is to keep a log book. One of the speakers they had at the last, second to the last Salt Strong meeting, logs every day he fishes. He logs in a notebook, tides, yeah. moon, all that stuff. And then, you know, the fish he caught, the bait he was using and stuff like that. I'm trying, you know, I, in my mind, at least, I can't seem to figure out a pattern to bait and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, so that's that's one thing I think if you kept a log book, it would be helpful to keep, you know, develop, see if there's any kind of pattern to things. But I wonder if the patterns are being, you know, disrupted by, well, they get disrupted by, you know, hurricanes, excess, a lot of rain. Rain, yeah. Yeah, um, really high northeast, a northeaster that blows, you know, really high tides in. Um, so I think that screws things up, um, for us, not the fish, the fish don't care, but right. you know, they, you know, they, 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 they're not in the areas they usually will be. And I have a theory too about fishing is if you're not in my, in saltwater fishing, specifically in, in brackish water, like the St. John's river, if you're not catching fish, you just haven't found them, especially redfish, redfish eat. And this is kind of a controversial statement. I don't <laughs> they eat anything and they eat all the time. So if you're not catching redfish, you just, you just aren't them. finding them. Right. And one of the challenges also that I talk about in my last video I posted last night is the clarity of the water in the St. John's River. It's really dirty. So, you know, what attracts the fish? Is it the vibration of the lure? Is it the rattle? You got to have something that attracts it. And like the video I posted last night, one of the things I think works for tarpon uh, is you know these 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 type of swim baits that you, you were telling me about those right the, the tail flaps at yeah. the meeting what's the one the yeah and um, I think the the uh, the vibration of the tail um, the fish pick it up with their lateral line now each, each you know all these fish have a lateral line that runs down the side of their body that's their ears and that's how they hear yeah I saw that on your uh, salt strong presentation that you did and what was cool about that is i did a whole show on lateral lines yeah and i think that that is the most under people don't understand right. that i think the lateral line is everything it, it mean, is everything is, that's, and it's, it's, it's just sixth sense that's it, how it, fish yeah it's it. just like e your ears so if if like you have, have workers in here and if they're in the kitchen uh, and they hit their hammer on something i can immediately look and see my ears know what direction and, and then that's how the lateral line works on the fish they right. know exactly where stuff is by a noise or whatever um these swim baits uh, amazingly enough it's a pretty fast retrieve with these um medium fast retrieve and it keeps the bait about a foot to two feet below the surface and with visibility you know visibility not sunlight but visibility of 18 to 20 inches of visibility because of the cloudy water um this bait tracking, you know, two feet below the surface, the sun is going to pick up on it. So they're, they're, they're going to be able to key in up. But if I can't see two feet in the river, I don't think the fish can either. Right. So they've got to depend on something, which is a rattle or a vibration, right. to pick up on that bait. Um, 100%. And if you watch the video I just posted last night, and some of the slow motion, this is the stuff that gets me so excited when I, re, when I get home and... You know, you know this about when yeah. you edit, actually edit the video and you do the slow mo and all that stuff. Um, stuff you didn't see because it's so fast, right? Right. Um, and you see that you now see the the head wake. So the head wake, you know, the fish is a foot or eighteen inches below the surface, right, coming at the lure, and then 
then he follows it literally you can see from last night's video literally at the boat um, that's one thing I tell people is keep the bait in the water all the way to the tip of your rod because <laughs> You don't know what's going to hit. I had yeah. so many tarpon and trout hit right at the boat. Yeah. And you see them, the followers, you know, when you're oh, bringing yeah. it in and sometimes you get it to the boat and then they swim away. When yeah, they, yeah they right, boat, right, right. Or they make a stab at it and yeah. miss it and then and, 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 and leave. So, yeah, so um, that's that's really the exciting part of, of going back and watching the videos. Like I said in the video last night, I, I, uh, I do these videos purely for myself, especially the tarpon ones. Um, uh, now that I've got the GoPros and I'm shooting at 120 frames per second, the slow mo is just so beautiful. Uh, yeah. Uh, on the uh, on the strikes, and the jumps, and it's still, you know, uh, people. I catch one out of 20 fish, maybe. On the tarpon. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't really care that if I get four or five jumps out of that fish <laughs> right. close right. up to the boat. Pff, that's my day. Right. <laughs> my day is done. Yeah, 100 percent. Happy. You know. So. Uh, it's uh, so art going back to artificial versus live. Um, you know, last when I started fishing tarpon in the St. John's River three years ago when I got the boat, um, I would drag, you know, uh, leave a mullet out the back of the boat, one or two, two, you know, per single person with two live baits out of the back of the boat is freaking nuts because you get lines tangled yeah. up oh, and yeah. you know, all kinds of problems. Um, but I, uh, you know, this, this year I did that too. Um, I would have like, uh, recently over here in Mill Cove, I would have one on a float, maybe five or six feet down with a small, uh, split shot on it. Um, and some sort of live bait. I was using uh, silver trout, silver trout, yellow mouth, weak fish, all the same. Uh, there's no limit or size limit on those. So if you catch them small, they're easy to catch. And um, catch them on paddle tails and stuff, and uh, put them out. And uh, one on a float, and then one with a couple of split shots on it down. So one up, one down. And um, you know, during the summer months, you're getting tarpon. This fall, I got you know two nice 42-inch redfish on that. Um, one 42-inch redfish ate a 18-inch uh, ladyfish. Which, wow. oh really? That you had baited up? Yeah, I put I put the eighteen inch ladyfish out because I thought you know there should be tarpon around, right? Because right. ladyfish is, is a great tarpon bait. Um, and what I really believe happened probably is I, there were sharks around too. There's sharks in Mill Cove too, bull sharks. And I and this has happened before where I've real I've had a hit and I reel up the line and there's just a head of the ladyfish on the on the hook, and. I, I truly believe, I don't think the redfish ate that old ladyfish. I think a shark maybe took part of it. Uh, I didn't notice right. it. Right. And then the redfish took the came rest. Came to clean up. Yeah. yeah, it came to clean up. Um, but um, so I'll have one high, one low, maybe to avoid entanglement. If I get a fish on, I try to reel up the other one. Um, I'm using circle hooks. So yeah. uh, you don't have to worry. It, it actually, the guide, guides will tell you that I've watched a lot of videos. The guides just says this is great for you know amateur fishermen because um, you have to set it. You don't have yeah. to set it. Yeah, and if you set the drag right, um, you have to set the drag just so enough that that hook sets, but you can still get the rod out of the rod holder because um, you have it too tight. It's really hard to get the rod out of the rod holder. Um, so. Um, yeah, I love it, circle hooks. Yeah, you don't have to worry yeah. about you don't have to worry about setting the hook or anything. And you, and you can actually tarpon. You can reel up the other reel while the rod's other rod's still in 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 the rod holder, and then um, they wear themselves out jumping like crazy. There's one video I shot where I did that where I just let I didn't let him go, but I was reeling up the <laughs> other line while he was running with you know that's why I have 300 yards of line on my reels because I figure I'm gonna let him go. Um, and they kind of wear themselves out and you know, they do four or five jumps and they're pretty worn out by that point. Um, and, uh, the circle hooks, I don't think I, I've only lost, I lost one fish on a circle hook, uh, which is a video that was this summer where I used a lighter weight one because the bait was small right? and it straightened, it, it didn't out. straighten the hook, but it bent the hook enough. <laughs> so he got off. Right. Right. Um, so I don't know if you notice these little, I put this little mono on here. There's a, uh, when you're using Menhaden, which this is what a Menhaden looks like, a pogey, 
Um, I call it, we, we call it white bait. Pogies, thread fins, um, greenies. Uh, it's a very narrow, thin bait. And when you use a circle hook, one of the problems with it is uh, when you hook them either through the lip or through the eye, is this, the bait, if it's swimming around a lot, will actually turn the hook and hook itself. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Show us up in the, the camera Yeah, there. so um, if you hook them through the eye or through, even through the lip, the fish, will, the bait will swim around and the hook will actually turn and hook into itself in back into the fish and the fish is kind of wobbling sideways. So what you do, and I learned this from a tarpon fisherman, is you just tie a little piece of mono on there um, and when you put the bait on, it can't it can't go past there. So you can kind of adjust that up or down. And when you hook the bait on. So it's on, just like a little knotted piece of mono. Yeah, just a little seems, knotted oh, piece of mono. And that keeps the bait from turn that keeps the hook from turning onto the um, and hooking into the gill or side right. side of the of the bait fish. Uh, but that was a really good tip I learned from uh, watching a, a podcast on tarpon fishing. Yeah, that's a good tip. I mean Yeah. I know at California, for example, we get a lot of California viewers. Um, we use a lot of circle hooks for when they're going out tuna fishing. Tuna fishing, and right, they right. fly line yeah. live bait, but yeah. um, and it's almost and they're probably using a, a, a bait hooks. that's really thin, a very thin type live. Usually bait. anchovies or sardines. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And this is perfect for that. Yeah. This is perfect for that. And it's just a little piece of mono scrap that you tie on there with any kind of knot, just so you have something there that keeps the bait from keeps the hook from turning onto that. And hook it onto the gill. It's a great tip. Yeah, yeah. See, so get some of those guys to try it out there for sure. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I start, I wanted to uh, learn to use artificial, and I, you know, I, I fish all. I mean, I shop everywhere, but um, my main place I buy most of my stuff as Resellers Reef. But we have an Academy Sports near, and I pick these up. These crazy croakers, and it looks like a real croaker. And I know croakers are a great bait for a lot of things. And um, they have a whole line of swim baits like this. I call them segmented swim baits. They're actually, there's fabric in there. It's a Kevlar right, right. held together by Kevlar. And it um, has a real good swimming action. And uh, they have a lo whole line. They've got uh, a lot of, besides the uh, Crazy Croaker, they've got um, uh, shads, all different kinds of shads. And uh, I've caught redfish on all the different types of baits, but you know, a common thing in, 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 in fishing, you've heard fishermen say, is if you could only use one bait the rest of your life, right. what would that be? And this it would be the crazy croaker, That'd be the hands one. down. And I you love paddle tails and stuff, and I think you catch a lot of fish on paddle tails. But one thing about the crazy croaker is the smallest red fish I've ever caught on this is 18 inches. Wow. It doesn't catch small fish. Because I believe it's... I think it's the size of the it's bait. It's because of the size. It's four inches. Yeah. So it's you're eliminating the, the small ones. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, the tarpon cannot resist it. Uh, it's 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 crazy. Um, Are you fishing like super shallow for like the redfish, or is that seasonal thing? Yeah. Well, I'm kind of new to the area, new learning fishing, and the only time I've been redfish fishing, I've gone out with like guides and stuff, and we've gone like where they take the pole and they're pushing their boat. We're like. Right, super Less shallow. than a foot of water. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. In is the that sense where you're going, in, or are you fishing? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Deeper? So one of the places I fish uh, just uh, south of of Doctors Lake Inland on St. John's River is an area called Moccasin Slough, and it's super shallow there. Uh, boaters call it Pineapple Point. It's raggedy. It's actually physically raggedy point, um, but it's super shallow there, and there's a lot of structure in the water, a lot of logs, a lot of trees, a lot of branches, uh, a lot of stuff in the, in the water, and a lot of shells. So there's a lot of, and the shell, if you can get clear enough water that you can see clamshells in the bottom, uh, that's a good indication because the clamshells hide uh, these small little crabs and things that the redfish oh, eat. Yeah, so when I clean any, any fish, I learned this from my grandfather, we open up the stomach to see what they're eating, right? And um, yeah, the redfish will have these little black crabs in them a lot. And, um, you know, that's what they're feeding on uh, around these clam beds and and tree branches and logs and stuff that are around there. So yeah, that's that's sometimes less than a foot of water. If you watch my frustrating tarpon video where I'm getting the head wakes and no bites on these juvenile tarpon, we just cannot figure out how to catch those things. They would follow the bait up and stuff, but that, that water was 18 inches a foot deep. 
Nice. Um, yeah, so, and, and pretty clear with those days, the water was pretty clear. And it might have been another issue with when the water gets clear, you know, I'm not sure some of these baits work as well. Um, I don't know, it's all theory. I don't... Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, that's definitely a, a, I think a thing that is true. Uh, from my experience, like when the waters, I, mean, I don't know here, but it doesn't get like crystal clear water. Like right. in California, the, the bays, sometimes that water is like, you could see the bottom at like 40 feet deep. Yeah, right. And that's typically, you know, you're going to have a rough day fishing. When they can see, when they know what they're looking at, it's a lot harder. Yeah. Because they know what's going on. Yeah. And I think the dirtier water, uh, it does help for sure. Yeah, yeah. We go back to they're using the lateral, they're using senses, right. not their eyes. eyes right. They're just using a predatory, instinctual bite. Something's in there. When they territory. see everything that's going on, when they can see it and feel it, it's, you can have a rough day because yeah. it's, it's harder to get them to get to bite here. I have three aquariums as well, and I've got one aquarium that's these tilapia. I catch I catch fish in the local pond near my house, and um, I got one that's full of tilapia, and then I've got one with I had a bass, but I had to get rid of him because he was he would eat anything that went in the tank. I got <laughs> a, a couple bluegills in that, and a bunch of what's called sleeper gobies. Um, that I call He's like it. in your house, like big aquarium. Yeah, big, oh, okay. yeah. So I feed you fish a bass a lot. in there. So I think I think I think I think fish react to eating their, their main objective is to eat something but they're also especially bass i feel anything that comes into their territory they're going to attack um and it's i'm not sure it's an eating preference i think it's something in their territory they're pissed off you know and the snook are like that too i know snook um i fished a lot of snook down in fort myers and um territorial very <laughs> territorial and um you know, something comes into their area and they uh, they attack it. Um, I'm sure it has to do somewhat with eating something, but it's more, I think it's more of something's in their area and they don't want it there. Snook fishing in Fort Myers was a blast. My dad and my mom lived at Punta Rasa, which is, if you go, uh, if you're going on a Sanibel Island, you go through the toll booth, at Punta Rasa is right on the right hand side. There's a boat ramp there, Pier 50 Marina. My dad kept his boat there. He had a 20 foot Grady White um, kept his boat there in the rack and uh, we'd go out fishing, but we would fish right off those rocks there um, and catch snook, you know, with little, we, we were using stuff we used up north for salmon, little Cleos. Um, and, uh, but my, one of my favorite lures for snook, believe it or not, was uh, a barracuda lure. So the two, the, a green, green particularly, the bright green tube lure, the treble hook on it. And uh, my first house I lived at, uh, I was maybe a quarter mile from a marina, a Pepper Tree Point Marina, and had a T-shaped pier that went out in the Clusatchee River. And I could go out there, and a friend of mine was, uh, was a, uh, the marina guy there, and he would let me, it's a private marina, but he'd let me on the dock. And um, I could go out there in the T-shaped dock, and again, like a foot of water, tide running, which doesn't matter what direction it was running, but the fish would pay face into the tide, un sitting underneath the dock. It was a lighted right. dock, too. So right at sundown, as it was getting dark. And I, could, I had a pier net, and I could go down there, and I could cast um, down the uh, dock, from the T part of the dock, and reel as fast fast as I could. I mean, you, you cannot reel too fast. You still get smoked. Oh my God, they would come out from that dock and nail that tube lure. And uh, I remember one night particularly, I went out there and there was a bunch of people out there watching the sunset. And uh, maybe five or six people, older people, because it was a kind of a retirement community, like everything in Fort, in Fort Myers. <laughs> and, um, and I said, I came out kind of cocky and I said, yeah, my wife said to get dinner. And they all kind of laughed and, uh, I made three casts. I got a 10 pound snook in the net. The guy helped me land it. And uh, I went home <laughs> with a 10 that pound snook. That's awesome. Yeah, it was, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're some of the, <clears throat> that was bass back when there was no limit on them. You could, you could catch whatever you wanted and no size limit on them at all. And, um, but that's, snook is probably, snook, cobia, grouper, probably the three best eating fish uh, in Florida. I haven't had the other two. I've had grouper. Um, Kobe is incredible. Snook. Maybe I've had Kobe. I'm, I don't, I don't think so though. Yeah. Kobe is really good. 
Um, and we used to catch cobia right at the Sanibel Bridge there. Um, Do cobia come in the river here? No, or no. They, you'll catch like them. You've got to go out in the Atlantic, and right. you've got to look for uh, a little cooler temperature change in the summertime. Um, they hang under manta rays. And oh, you'll see you'll see manta rays out in the Atlantic once in a while. I've seen them a few times. And they'll hang under manta rays. Um, they look, I, and I don't know if they're related, but they look like a remora. Yeah. A big remora. Right, right. And uh, like hair. remoras, they hang around uh, uh, shelter. Yeah. So large rays and things like For that. For people that don't know, the remora is the fish that the sucks on. Sorry, right, exactly. Rays and sharks and... Like yeah. like that. that one, uh, the, their my, head looks like a shoe. Like yeah, the bottom yeah. of a shoe, and they yeah. stuck onto the. Yeah, the uh, um, second, the last, the last redfish video I posted where I caught the forty-inch redfish, forty-two-inch redfish. There was a remora on him. Oh, really? Yeah, wow. it was stuck in him, and I actually picked it off and threw it in the water. <laughs> um, I'll take pictures That's and stuff. So, because um, when you did your seminar too, there was something interesting. You were, and I know you had talked about it earlier. How there was the fish only do three things, right? And there was. What are those those three things? And Swim, breed, and and eat. That's it. Swim. That's it. Yeah. And and uh, I, I find it interesting. Even even some experienced guides will say things like, "I heard a tarpon guide say this." Um, I don't think a tarpon thinks a bait just falls out of the air. First of all, if you use think with a fish, it's just yes. that this isn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so if you watch uh, dead not deadliest catch but the uh, tuna. Tuna guys. Wicked Tuna? Wicked Tuna, yeah. That one of the episodes, I think it was Wicked Tuna, um, one of the episodes they had a marine biologist woman on the boat, and they had just caught like a six or seven hundred pound tuna. And they were, then these guys talk about these fish thinking and doing things like, you know, thinking like a human being and stuff. And the lady said, you know, their, their, their brain is the size of a marble. Right, right. So they're not thinking, yeah. they're reacting. And uh, yeah, so swim, breed, and 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 and, and eat. That's that's yeah. all they do, and that's all that's in their head. Um, I totally agree with that. You know, because it's I've talked about that too. Is that we we try to romanticize it, and we over, yeah. we overanalyze it, and we one of the problem I think we make as fishermen is we start we start thinking like we're the fish, or we start thinking we're projecting. We start thinking fish think like us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they don't. So yeah. we start getting in our own heads and. I like how you made that point because it really simplifies what fishing is. And yeah. we tend to overcomplicate it. Like sometimes they see these baits and people go, oh, fish aren't going to eat that. Fish aren't going to eat that. And, but fish isn't us. We yeah. see it and we're like, well, obviously that's not a bait. We wouldn't eat that. Yeah. Obviously it doesn't look real. But like you said, we don't have a brain the size of a BB or a marble. And yeah. it, it's, they're predatory and they're instinctual and they, we overcomplicated it. I just thought that that was a great point. That it's it's funny you say that because when Sonia and I, when I first met Sonia and took her fishing, you know, I was using these. Uh, one of my favorite baits was a little two dollar fifty cent Walmart the bomber, green and silver, uh, lip, you know, suspended or floating bait. And um, she'd say, oh, "Nothing's going to bite that." And I'd catch right. fish on it all the time. Yeah. I used to call it a fish finder because if nothing was biting, I could I could find fish with that lure and and get get hookups um yeah they, it's it's yeah i think we as human beings project too much onto the fish um there's like, definitely they, they, you know they definitely school for some reason I, I don't know why and i tried to get a hold of a of a professor at university of virginia one time i read and i wrote to her a couple times and never got an answer but for especially was studying fish and especially redfish and stuff and so, what, two years ago, if you go back to my videos, we had four days in front of Moosehaven and the St. John's River in a foot of water where you could just sit there, and it was like almost clockwork. You could sit there, and we were fishing, and all of a sudden, I had a, I had a, a dead bait hanging out the back of the boat, and we were both casting, and all of a sudden, we had three fish on it, three redfish on it. Wow. And... If you watch my video, I'm looking, oh my God, there's hundreds of redfish swimming around here. And we're in less than two feet of water. And you'd have maybe a minute or two, and they'd be gone. That's right? It. Yeah. And then an hour later, they'd come back. <laughs> and I didn't see any, now, not, not that I didn't, not that they weren't there, but I didn't see any bait in the water. Um, what were they doing? Why, why? And these were, you know, these were high slot, twenty-seven to 
33 inch fish and it's hunting all you had to do is throw heck you'd probably throw an empty hook in the water and they'd bite it right they were they were going crazy just hungry yeah Probably just looking yeah I yeah think the and um, fisher. for four days and so the first video i made is once in a lifetime these fish come in we could we triple hook up da, 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 da. so the next day we went back same thing so it was the second lifetime type fish four days in a row we went back to that spot and since then, I've not, and I've gone back to that spot so many times. Right. I have caught redfish there, but not, right. not in never a had school. That, that same None like that. Um, and then, you know, the end of the video I posted yesterday, that was two years ago in the St. John's River. And Sonia and I were out on a Sunday. It was a terrible day. It was windy. We went on to Good Beast Creek. It was windy, wet, raining. We had raincoats on. It was October. Uh, it was nasty out for nasty for Florida. Uh, and uh, we were, weren't catching anything. We went to Beauclair Bluffs, which is my favorite places right before uh, Plumber's Cove and the, and the Buckman Bridge there. That's the other thing I do in my videos. I tell people where I am and that kind of aggravates some. <laughs> that has yeah, aggravated people... a couple fishermen who have fished all their lives on the St. John's River right, and giving up these spots. Yeah. But they anyway. Think nobody else knows about it. Right? Yeah, right, right. Except them. So, so uh, we were at, we didn't were catching anything, and I noticed a bunch of birds diving out and towards the middle of the St. John's River. Birds were diving, and I thought, oh, jacks, this will be fun. Let's get some jacks, right? So we scooted out there, and we we caught I caught we caught two redfish, and they were redfish schooling, and they were pushing shrimp up to the surface. So I went the next day, and that was the video at the end of this. The video I posted yesterday at the end, where it's perfectly calm with. It's perfectly dead calm. And you can see the birds diving. And I thought they were bait fish until I, one of the seagulls flew over my head. And I could see he had a shrimp hanging out of his mouth. And wow. um, so the, the schooling redfish were... And one of my videos, which I, I didn't put that clip in, but one of my videos, um, I just landed one, let him go. And I was going to recast again. And I noticed from here to where your child seat is sitting here... Um, a swirl, and I just tossed the bait over there and hooked a redfish, you know, <laughs> yeah. so they were literally underneath my boat. Um, yeah, so that was two years ago, but this year they, they, I didn't see them, and I looked all over that area from um, what's called Epping, Epping Forest Yacht Club, Good Beast Creek, Bowles School, um, the NAS, uh, Navy Air Station's on the other side, um, all the way to the Buckman Bridge, I cruised all that a lot this October and didn't see any of that. And there's a lot of shrimp in the river. So that's another thing. It's like, why did the redfish not come back and, and, and you know, go after those shrimp right. again this year? And when I was doing that, several of my viewers went out and did the same thing and were chasing those schools of redfish. And you had to just kind of sit in the middle of the river and look for birds or just kind of cruise around listening for, you hear them a lot of times first, the squawking, um, and uh, look for birds that are diving. And, uh, you know, you, if you can get up to them and you got a trolling motor that can push your boat at a reasonable speed, man, they move fast though. Um, and I have chased quite a few, but I could not catch up with them. You right. know, with, even with the trolling motor going almost three miles an hour, I could not catch up with the they're gone with the with the fish yeah that's crazy so, so how, how often um how many days a week you think you fish well recently i have not been out a lot i had a blue tire on my trailer but yeah you know during the summertime i go four or five days, or a, five week, days five, a week five six days a week um i hate weekends because everybody's of, out <laughs> well it's it's the what it's the wakes you yeah, know, I'm, I'm 69 years old and sitting up in that chair where I am, I've got my, if you notice my boat, I have a, I have a polling, I mean, I have a platform and then I have my seat up pretty high and you sit there and rock right, all day right. with those waves. It is exhaust. It's exhausting. It's like riding a horse. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, so, uh, yeah, it's the wakes on the weekends that, that drive me crazy. Even. I, I curse the four day work week now because people are taking off freaking Fridays <laughs> and Fridays are like a Saturday now, right. which is uh, aggravating to a person like me. So one thing I wanted to touch on, so you fish a lot and 
something you alluded to earlier. We've all familiar with the um, the ninety ten theory, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I'm curious how. I want to know for you personally how how quickly do you move spot to spot? How many casts do you make? Because you say if the fish, like the redfish, eat all the time, or fish eat all the time, right? That's yeah. so what they do. They eat, sleep, and they mate. Yeah. Like how how many? And this goes. I think this is universal. It's not just a St. John's River thing. It goes for all fishing. Yeah. But when you go to a spot, how long do you fish it before you move on? Do you give it an hour, thirty minutes, or are you just moving until you find them? And when you find them, do you stay? Okay, so yeah, I have a theory about that too. Because I'm retired, I can spend a whole day in one spot, and I really try to force myself to do that. And I don't want to be what I call a star fisherman, where you go here, 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 and it forms a star when you right. <laughs> put it on a map. Right? Like, yeah, yeah, that's that's to me. Um, I, and if you what's what's deceiving about fishing videos, especially mine. Uh, is that you don't see the hours yes, of not catching yes, anything, yeah. right? I, I'm not posting a video of not yeah. catching anything, of right? Of course, of course. So I can tell you that between Moccasin Slough and Beauclair Bluffs, um, I have spent, Beauclair Bluffs, I've spent, literally spent hours fishing there and we'll get one tarpon on. Or hours fishing there, uh, towards the end of the, video I posted last night where all the, where I did the slow-mo while all the schooling redfish that just scattered when I was bringing that 33 inch one in. Um, that was, I was there, that was like 11 o'clock and I was out there at six o'clock in the morning. Right. Right. And I just happened to see, and this is something really, really, this is what the advantage of fishing every day too, is training your eye and your ears, but your eyes particularly to notice disturbances on the water yeah, and not awake from a boat, not a wind breeze or something like that. What is a fish versus a breeze of wind or a wake of a boat or a rogue wave or whatever. And I just happened to notice out by the no wake sign, something weird. So I kind of headed over there and I casted, I was, like I said in the video, I was using the NLBN, um, the big mullet. And, um, it was a big school of redfish. And uh, my, my one big tip about if you find a school of redfish like that and you're fishing with a buddy, uh, get your buddy to throw near where your fish is fighting because those fish are just like chickens. Uh, we have chickens. So one thing you do is you can go out there and feed them bread, right? So if you throw one piece, if you got 20 chickens and you throw one piece of bread out there, a chicken's going to get it, and all the other chickens are going to chase him and try to get it out of his mouth. The fish do exactly the same thing. The redfish will chase the other fish with the bait hanging out of the redfish's mouth. They're going after they're that trying bait, to trying it, to yeah. get it out of their mouth. The mahi-mahi do that, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, if you get your buddy to throw near him, no, you can double hook take up. The advantage right. of it. Right, so your buddy oftentimes is getting the landing net. No, don't get the landing net. Right. <laughs> throw it's near where, you, where, where, you're, where you're fighting the other fish. And so, Yeah. That's interesting. So you, you'll... You, I'll, I'll fish. I will try so you and pick a spot, and then you you like to pick it. a spot a day before, and you'll sit there kind of all work day it. and, and work, work it. it. Interesting. Yeah, I look at tides. I look at wind. Wind is a big factor for me. I I, I try to stay out of the wind, um, and I look at tides. Uh, outgoing is, seems to be a little bit better. Again, anecdotal evidence. I don't. You know, I've caught fish every tide, but. Um, you think there's one tide better. that's better than the other? Or it it seems matter. like outgoing is better and low tide is better. And it's just logical because it seems to concentrate the water more, I guess. Or um, yeah. visibility is better in shallow water, too, because the sunlight can get to the bottom. So maybe they're picking up you know, bait better that way. It is something I've noticed, too. Like I've only been out here twice, actually, in my kayak. I've been so busy yeah. <laughs> getting the house together. but And I think... The few catches I've had were on outgoing tide, I noticed yeah. as well. That's that's interesting. Yeah. 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 And one of the reasons I like fishing in the Mill Cove area is the tide doesn't run really fast. So you don't have to use a lot of heavy weight. A lot of the guys who fish the bull reds in the river, you have to use eight, ten ounces of weight to get down with heavy rods and stuff. And right. I just that doesn't appeal to me. Um and, and actually fishing live bait doesn't appeal to me either, per se. I I like the excitement of catching something on you know, an artificial bait, you know, you're kind of fooling them with. I have to get you some of my jigs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what they're for. Like, so you don't, if you need the heavy ounces, you work the 
slow pitch jig and it's an artificial but yeah you, you can get down to those deep zones you know it's not a plastic it's it's interesting yeah one thing i have discovered and i'm pretty sure about this is whether you're using a live target or you're using the um i'm gonna leave these for you too here when you're using a live target like this or the crazy croaker is if you notice that hook points at the eye right this is it does not it, you can hook a fish, but somehow they, if, if he changes direction, I've had this thing come out. Oh, interesting. And I've noticed that if I bend this hook straight, if I open the hook up. That's what you were saying earlier. Yeah. yeah and make it kind of parallel with the bed, belly. And the same thing with this. Open that hook up a little bit and make it more parallel with the belly. I find my hookup's a little bit better. Huh. Uh, the other thing to watch on all hooks um, is a common thing that happens, and I notice this on my jigs too with my paddle tails. And um, I wear, uh, I got, I, you know, I've got sh short arm disease. You know, the old person can't see it, so I wear contacts. <laughs> However, I, I wear sunglasses with two and a half times bifocals in them, so which is like a magnifying glass, which is right. great. And I recommend that for anybody who's fishing, no matter how good your eye seat is, um, because uh, when you're looking at the tip of this hook, uh, the sharper the hook is, the better chance that tip has a chance to curl up. And I have noticed many, many of my baits, when I look, on, I, I look at it normally, I don't see it, but when I look under my two and a half magnifying bifocals and my sunglasses, that tip of that hook is curled. Interesting. And uh, I have such a, a fine point. I know it's really hard to see. And I have a file on my boat and I just kind of trim it up a little bit. I learned this from watching muskie fishermen. I love muskie fishing too. When I was up in Wisconsin, I used to live in Wisconsin, uh, did muskie fishing. They're, they're fanatical with sharp hooks. I mean, they're just nuts about <laughs> sharp hooks, right? And I kind of learned that about them. Um, and you just need to dress that tip of that hook up and get that bend out of, out of the tip but the bifocals really help look at that. And you'll see that in jigs. So if you're fishing around oyster beds, oh, you are constantly yeah. going to have yeah, yeah, that yeah. curl on the tip of your hook um, because you're constantly snagging the yeah. oyster beds. 100%. So you're, you, you've got you've to watch that. So the bifocals, again, normal eyesight, I don't see it. But you go on the, on the two and a half or two times bifocal, and you'll see that little bit of curl on there. And that's enough so that it just, just doesn't bite um, enough to get a, get a hook on there. So, um, that's a good tip. Yeah. I've tried, so, uh, I haven't really done, you know, but I know people do carry like a little file with them and it's probably, yep. <laughs> probably not a bad idea. It's something I haven't done, but yeah, you makes you wonder how many fish you've lost because of it. You know? Yeah. And you it's just, like it's just things. about, you know, dress, it's simple. dressing up the tip yeah. of the hook. Yeah. And I try to put, um, and then again, I, this, I learned this from the musky guys. Um, I try to put like a chisel. So I, I, I take, if, if this is the tip of the hook, I do like this and like this and try to get a kind of a knife point on the top part of that hook and a point on the tip of the hook so this is kind of like a like an arrow uh like an arrow in hunting would be it would have a knife point on it um instead of having the hook rounded right actually putting a ch uh, kind of a chisel point on it right. um and that seems to work a little bit better as well but constantly looking at your hooks uh, especially after a fish after a snag um after you know, hitting an oyster bed um, is something you really, really got to do uh, to check that hook tip. So yeah, um, paddle tails, I was using, pat before I discovered the Crazy Croaker or the swim baits at all, I was using a lot of paddle tails, DOA, um, the green with the green, uh, the kind of a darker green with the green, bright green chartreuse uh, tail or white with a chartreuse tail. Um, going back to what fish think, Right. You know, what the heck does that look like? I guess it looks like a shrimp or it looks like something, you know, and I find that jerking it, slow retrieve. My daughter, you know, she caught on a bass assassin paddle tail. Um, well, on a regular DOA paddle tail, when I took her out on Father's Day, she caught her at that time, 33 inch redfish, her, her biggest redfish. And then I took her out later that month, I think, I think it was July. And uh, it's so funny, we were seeing, in that, in that video, you'll see that my side scan, 
literally hundreds of I redfish in the bottom. Yeah, oh, yeah, crazy. it was crazy. Yeah, that was wild. And uh, you'll see in the video, um, it's a typical, well, she's 22. She just got into law school at UF, so I'm very proud of her. She's doing great. Um, and um, I'll be seeing her this afternoon. And she just got back from school. So anyway, uh, she, uh, uh, we were watching the side scan, and she wouldn't even cast. She was on her phone. She, I said, oh, there's some fish. So she would cast, and she cast the Bass Assassin, which is a longer paddle tail. Same thing, kind of moss green and then a bright green tail. And, um, and I use the uh, Tsunami jigs because they're cheap at Walmart. They're like $2.50 for like six of them. Um, and they're called a bo boxing glove head, which is a... a oh, interesting. Like yeah, it's called it. a boxing glove head. So it looks like a boxing glove with little black eyes on it, green. Anyway... So, you know, if you watch on the video, she's not even paying attention. She throws the line out there, and all of a sudden, she's, she's hooked <laughs> she up. So, it. I mean, the, the thing wasn't even moving, I think. It was just probably falling, which is a lot of, you'll see this, bass fishermen will talk about this, the fall. Yes. 100%. A lot of fish pick up on the fall, yes. so that the jerk, the fall, the jerk, the fall. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think that's what happened. And it was right near a dock. That's the other thing. I, I catch very few of my fish near a dock. Almost all of them are well away from a dock. And guys... And I still fish. I fish docks constantly. I throw at docks all the time. You just don't have a lot of success with it. But majority of fish, fish I catch are well away from the docks. Interesting. Um, and you just looking for them like a no, no. I'm just blind casting. I'm just blind casting. And I know this. I, I know the fish are supposed to be hanging around structure. That's always the thing. But. Um, I, uh, I've just had most of my luck. I can pretty much tell you three, maybe four of all the hundreds of redfish I've caught were within three feet of a dock. Every other fish has been way away from a dock. Interesting. That's yeah. a good, I, I like that philosophy. I, like you, you have a different version of a lot of the norms, you know, that we adhere to. Like one of the things you always hear is finding the structure, structure right. is like a golden rule. And then, and I, and I think that's important. Yeah. But I, you but you've can't been, throw but out you've everything had success. else. But you you've had success yeah. Oh, yeah. away from structure. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's valuable information, you know? Yeah, and the tarpon is, is weird, too, because in Mill Cove here, there's a, uh, and I, can, I can't emphasize this enough, number one, have a uh, GPS-guided trolling motor um, it, it is really, really key. Yes. Having a power pole of some sort, you know, the power pole or the uh, Minn Kota Talon or whatever you got, that's fine. Some sort of way to anchor very quickly is in shallow waters, very, very good thing to have. Um, and having a good map system on your GPS of the water uh, that you're fishing in. So, um, and it's not so much, it's, the reason I went to Mill Cove was I've heard, I heard about it. It's a funny story. We were, we put in at Ortega River, Fishing Creek, boat ramp on a Sunday in the summer. I forget what, it was August. I think it was August. Anyway, we uh, we started fishing Avondale area, St. John's River, which is very successful there, very successful area, or Tager River, Avondale. And we ended up going downtown. I went, so the tide runs too, because the, the river narrows in downtown, the tide runs really fast there, and it's really hard to fish there with any kind of success because, you know, you got to use a lot of weight. So we went through downtown and we headed all the way north underneath the Matthews Bridge and the Hart, the Hart Bridge and the Matthews Bridge and or the Matthews and the Hart, whatever, and um, ended up, uh, and I was looking at my Google Maps too to see where boat ramps were and that's where I discovered the right. Lions boat ramp. And we went into, hey, I said, we're close to Mill Cove, let's go over there. Um, goat Island is right there, they call it. And, and then across the river is the Trout, Trout River. So we went into Mill Cove and I'm looking at my map and there's a deep channel in the middle of Mill, Mill Cove and it's 12, 14 feet deep, depending on the tide. Um, all the fishermen, ever since I fished there, only, I've only run into a couple of guys who watch my videos who fish where I was fishing for tarpon. Oh, interesting. Everybody else fishes the shorelines, which is fine. That's fine. You're going to catch all kinds of stuff along the shorelines. There's two different, three or four different islands there on one side and the big uh, spoil Island, which they, I guess they ship dirt out and sand and stuff. But anyway, um, so you can be kind of between these two islands out of, out of the main track of the, the main shipping channel of the St. John's River. This is uh, off, off the main shipping channel. So there's a channel that runs right through there. So I find a lot of fish are sitting, especially those silver trout, 
yellowmouths are sitting right in the middle of that 14 feet of water. They're down deep, and that's where you can catch them with. Catch them with um, and those are really good eating. You can catch, shit, we took, I don't know, 15 of them home the other wow. day. Um, and they're small, but you just, we scale them and Sonia fries them up and we, you know, eat them with the bones in and everything. So yeah. anyway, um, the, uh, uh, that channel seems to be like a little highway that runs through there underneath and then underneath the Dane Point Bridge. Um, and uh, I've, when the tarpon, I discovered tarpon there, I saw them rolling and I thought, wow, there's tarpon here. And that's when we started catching our first tarpon in that area. Um, and, you know, they're all range, like I said in the video, from 30 to 100 pounds, which are the most fun ones to catch. The one, if yeah. you go back a couple <laughs> years, I fought one in the St. John's River that had to be over 150 pounds. It was, wow. I, I spent an hour and 15 minutes with 65 pound test braid. Um, hour and 15 minutes before he wore through the, he must have had the hook in his mouth because he wore through the 60 pound mono. Oh, wow. Freighted, wow. freighted through. Yeah. And um, no, no jumps. And when a fish, when a red, when a tarpon doesn't jump, you got a big one on. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> and um, yeah, hour and 15 minutes, he finally wore through. I had him up to the boat several times. Um, so yeah, so uh, the tarpon seemed to sit in that, especially the drop-off, the drop-off is pretty dramatic. So you can actually sit right in the middle of that 14 feet and you can cast to five feet of water Which each way, side. Oh, interesting. But it's, it's, yeah, and it's a pretty dramatic drop-off. Right. Um, and the tarpon will be in the shallower water as well. I've seen them in the shallower water many times, but they seem to stay in that, uh, in that channel. And a few of my viewers I've met out there who, who, who were, you know, jumping tarpon were, Kind of hanging in that channel as well um that yeah so yeah the artificial has been um obviously it's the most key. fun yeah i get to going back to your question about working an area uh yeah i want to for one i want to work an area so i discover how shallow it is whether my boat can go in there my boat can go anywhere so whether the trolling motor can push my boat in there or not I carry a push pole with me to get me out of trouble. That's the only reason I use You're it. You're not using it to get in? No, I'm using it to get to, if I get stuck on something or get stuck in the weeds or wind blows me into the, you know, the grass or whatever, I can get out. Um, and I have used it in the softer uh, mud to anchor the front of my boat um, as well, but now oh, I use the trolling motor yeah. or, the, or the power pole. Um, so yeah, I will work in area to, to discover what the terrain is in that area and what the docks look like and what kind of bait fish might be there and stuff like that. Um, and then I, I uh, my friend, uh, Jason and Alex, they fl they'll, they'll come out once in a while, especially on weekends and fly a drone over and we oh, will see the fish and the drone. That's the other thing about the redfish, the, the few drone shots they've got, the redfish are just scattered. They're all over the place. They're not, and they're just swimming they're around. Concentrated, looking, yeah. Just, yeah, they're not, so they're almost like pelagic, right? They don't yeah, they're them. looking. Yeah. I just, I guess they're just hunting and swimming around. Um, they're uh, not sitting under a dock. They don't have a house. I mean, yeah, they don't stay there. Well, that was that was one of the arguments I got into with one of my one of my fans who want you know said I was giving up spots and you know they were going to get fished out. And uh, it's like they don't live there. Right? Yeah, yeah they're, they're I don't drawing. believe fish live in a particular place. I, I think they, uh, you will, f and if you only fish weekends, you may get into that trap of thinking they li do live in a certain spot. But when you fish every day, I, I can tell you, Beauclair Bluff, Plummer Cove, I went one day, I caught five or six 18, 19, 20 inch redfish in one particular spot over two hours. Okay, I went back the same the, the next day, same weather conditions, same tides, nothing. Nothing, yeah. And and even a, another friend of mine, Patrick, who who comes and fishes a certain dock all the time, you know, he'll have he'll catch a few fish there one day, and then he'll come back the next day and nothing. Um, so I, yeah, I, I it's so yeah, I don't like to move around a lot. Uh, I do have certain spots I do go to. If I'm not catching anything at one spot, but I like to learn a particular area, um, and I don't write off 
really any areas. Yeah. Um, same, uh, Doctors Lake has been great in the summertime, early summer. But as the water heats up and gets to be 90 degrees in Doctors Lake and the algae blooms come in, um, it's been, you know, spotty to say the least. <laughs> um, and the other problem, uh, one of the things I, I talk about in the video from last night is I have had a lot of fans uh, write to me and say, I saw tarpon, I saw tarpon rolling. And I truly believe, I know they want to be helpful, but I think they're seeing garfish. There oh, are tons of garfish in the river. If you go back, I did a video when the water was really clear up uh, near a seawall. I mean, there were dozens of garfish just sunning themselves in the sun uh, underneath this, this dock or around this dock. Um, and the garfish roll, the garfish do the same thing tarpon do. They suck air, just like tarpon do. I don't know how much you know about tarpon. I didn't, I didn't know that. Tarpon, tarpon <laughs> breathe air. I did air. not know that. Okay, so they have gills, yeah, they but they breathe the air as well. So okay. they come up and gulp air. One of the reasons tarpon can live in pretty much stagnant water, like they, they do in South Florida and some of the canals and oh, stuff, is because they, they, can, can they can breathe air. Garfish do the same thing. They're both very prehistoric fish that survived whatever happened to the earth millions of years ago. Um, and um, so they gulp air. So uh, they, that's what, what you see when they come up. You'll actually see, and their mouth is shaped, so their mouth comes up, and the top of their mouth is kind of up here. So they can come up and they can actually suck that air, come and make that roll. And you'll sometimes see the silver, like you see in the video right. last night, you'll see the silver or the black back and the black triangular dorsal fin and a black triangular tail fin. Those are two key factors to see in a tarpon. Garfish, when they roll, number one, they're brown. They're not black, brown or green. They don't have a dorsal fin at all. And if their tail fin breaks the water, uh, it's rounded. Interesting. Their tail fin's rounded. And uh, the uh, um, uh, the other thing about garfish is when they, they come out of the water, they have the really long snout. You'll actually see a lot of times, if you catch them right when they come out of the water, their snout will come out of the water. And it makes like a, um, it, it makes a ripple in the water, just like your on off switch symbol here. A circle with a line. That's oh, exactly yeah, yeah. what the ripple saying. looks like. Yeah, yeah. It looks like a, a line with a, cir a circle around it. That's what the, the ripple looks like. That's a garfish. If you're close enough to see that. Yeah. You gotta in calm that. water. That's great. So there's a ton of garfish out there. And I, you'll see some of my videos, I've caught pretty big garfish live. And that's the other problem with using live bait. You got garfish in the St. John's River. You got garfish in St. Augustine. You got sharks. And well, sharks will you don't want to catch. <laughs> I, I went out, I went out, tried to fish. Well, the sharks eat the artificials? No. Yes, not. I have. Oh, caught, oh, I really? did catch one shark on an artificial wow. one time. Um, it was a, was a Uzuri type dive bait. So... Yeah, I, I, um, I went out two years ago, if you go back a couple of years in my videos, uh, king fishing. I went out and tried to fish for kingfish like they do here with pogies uh, behind the boat and what they call bump trolling, or I use my trolling motor, but they call bump trolling, which you bump your motor in the gear and neutral, in the gear, neutral, in the gear, and you're going maybe a mile, mile and a half an right. hour, something like that and you're dragging some pogies behind the boat on the wire leader with a stinger treble hook stuck in the near the tail of the pogie and these are big pogies they're they're like five six inches and um so one of the problems i have is i have a not a very big live well so if, if i put a dozen pogies in there they die well, pretty quick uh, and hey, i even have a recirculator in there which will keep them alive for a little bit right. but they, they don't live long so um i caught I, I, I kind of lost count after 12 sharks. And you're using steel leaders, so you can't, right, they don't right. break off, right? Which is aggravating as hell. Um, so I start, I, the la next time I went out, I dragged, I trolled um, Yozuris, the big uh, six inch uh, crystal mineral Yozuris. The one that works the best is the silver with the blue back, uh, or one that looks like a little mackerel. Those seem to work the best. Over in Pensacola and stuff, they use a pink one. I, I tried the pink one, didn't have any luck. But in any case, dragging those uh, pretty fast, about four miles an hour, four to five miles an hour. Wow. Yeah, you um, have to swim. That's, that's pretty fast. And I, yeah. I, I tried one with a dive plane 
didn't really get anything on that. So I, I don't use a die plane anymore. I just use the, the big lip ones and just let them drag on their own. So four to five miles an hour. And uh, where I had the best luck is I um, had some mullet or some sort of frozen bait I had. And um, on my GPS, <clears throat> right in front of Alano Beach there, about 24 feet of water. And I uh, cut up, and I learned this from a guy, a uh, real hazardous fishing guy, uh, who does a lot of uh, offshore stuff, um, cutting up the chum in little, little pieces and throwing it out like, like bread, breadcrumbs on a trail. Oh, interesting. Okay, just one. Instead of just throwing it all instead out. Of, instead yeah. of throwing it out, right. just one at a time, because you don't want the fish to, to stay in there, you want them to follow you. Interesting. So I tracked it on my GPS all the way out, maybe about three miles I did that. And then I turned around and I came back the same track. And sure enough, boom, boom. Wow. I got a 15 pounder, my first kingfish. And then the second time I did it, another day, did the same thing, went back, came back and tracked. And I can only got one that's reasonably calm. And I went back, came back and tracked that same track where I had dropped a bunch of little pieces of you know, chum bait, cut bait, and uh, 30 pound kingfish. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that that's the only two kingfish I've caught, um, but you know, on but on artificial. And I the, the name of the video is uh, no pogies, no sharks, Yozuri. Yeah, that's awesome. Because <laughs> uh, I uh, I didn't have to deal with the sharks. Um, there is just a I don't know what the issue is with. I, I know they're trying to save sharks. I get all that. I, I I'm a conservationist. And any fisherman will tell you, live bait off the coast or even in the intercoastal waterway is the sharks, the sharks are crazy. Yeah. The yeah. sharks are crazy. There's just so many of them. 100%. That's awesome. And Jeff, coming up on time, about that's, that's great. hour and 15 I'm minutes. This, yeah, that's stuff. awesome. Little, my little presents for you. And, um, and again, these live targets work great too. Um, they get tore up pretty, and if you go back in one of my first tarpon videos under a dock there in St. John's River, that's what I was using. Yeah. I was using this, these uh, swim baits. I'll definitely try them. Caught, we'll, hooked up three tarpon, little tarpon underneath that dock right away. Definitely got to go out there. I'm looking forward to fishing with you for sure, learning some of the, the real trip, next the real week, tips. Let's, let's, let's do it next yeah, week. We'll definitely. Next week we, I can come up here, we can meet at the boat ramp, and uh, we'll go out over to Mill Cove and see what we can find. Yeah, 100%. And where can uh, people find you, or what's the name of your YouTube channel for everybody out there? Uh, and with YouTube now, all you have to do is type in Jeff Battlefish, all one word, Jeff Battlefish, and that's where you find my YouTube channel. Right. Yeah. As you guys can hear, we got lots of construction going on. I promise them would only be an hour or so. We'll roll it up. Jeff, I really appreciate you coming out, man. It's Thank been you. awesome. And hey, guys. Thanks for watching. I apologize for the abrupt end of that uh, podcast. I got a lot of construction going on in my house, and um, I told the construction workers, that we, we only got to record about an hour. It was like right after that, they had work to do, so... Right at the very end, they were hit the side of the wall with a, one of those drill hammers or something. Uh, so it got really loud. So we had to cut it off. But thanks for watching, guys. Um, find Jeff on uh, Battlefish on YouTube. He's got a really cool channel. He's got a wealth of knowledge. You can find us, uh, Submission Fishing Company, submissionfishing.com. If you want to buy some of our lures, you can get them at a local tackle store. And, uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you on the next one. Oops.